Hi, I'm Bobby Halton, and welcome to the National Fireman's Journal podcast. And with me today is a dear old friend, Kevin Shea. And uh, uh, Kevin's been on the job for a long time. I won't ask him how old he is because that would be a HIPAA violation. And I'm just teasing him. But uh, <laughs> Kevin, ask anything, Bobby. I know. I hear you, man. So Ke- Kevin had a long career on many decorated companies with FDNY and uh, just was on some legendary events. And then, and, and now has a great training company. If you're interested in some training, we'll talk a little bit about that. And he also uh, helps me out at FDIC and other events that I do from time to time. And uh, he's knowledgeable at virtually every aspect of firefighting and has been involved with virtually every aspect of firefighting for low these many years. Ken, what, what year did you start with the fire service? Um, I started uh, when I was a kid. I turned 18 and 78 and uh, joined the volunteers where I lived on Long Island, um, Hicksville Fire Department. Hicksville? And, uh, yes, yeah, Hicksville, Long Island. And then um, joined FDNY in uh, 1984. Wow, okay. Okay. As a kid, I used to buff with my dad, who was a fireman in uh, the Bronx, in the South Bronx. And um, so, yeah, I didn't get into fire service till I was 18, but was intrigued and passionate about it since a child, you know. Buff, buff in the South Bronx in the 60s. Yeah, well, 70s. <laughs> 60s, I had to be babysat. 70s oh, when go. I buffed, yeah. There you go. Well, good times. No buff in the Bronx. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting because that's a term that, you know, some folks might not be familiar with, but buffing used to mean riding out, visiting, riding along, catching jobs. And it used to be a lot more folks doing it than do it today. Um, yes. You know, and, and it used to be a lot more welcoming. We, we didn't have as many lawyers then. No, no. When, when I was doing it, um, it wasn't so much enthusiasts. It was more uh, kids with their dads, mostly. You know, you know? That's true. And, and someone once told me where the word buff came from. And for the life of me, I can't think of it right now. I used to know. Isn't that yeah. terrible? Don't yeah. go. No, no. I, it's so much trivia with the fire department. A little nostalgia. You can't know and, it all. And they, could have, bu- they could have been bullshitting me, too. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Because we yeah. do that. You know, oh, buff meant, you know, whatever. Oh, yeah. Well, if you don't know something, then I'm obviously right. It's right. <laughs> and, and Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's perfect. So, but you, those you know, were good times, and that's where my my passion for the fire department started as a kid, watching my dad and uh, uncles in the fire yeah, department. My dad, my, my dad, my uncles too. My my dad was a volunteer. My uncles were volunteers. And I remember my the most fun I had buffing was in Jersey because my my uh, my uncles owned a hardware store, Halton's Hardware, right there in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. And the firehouse was right across the street. And my nanny, my grandmother, lived above the hardware store. So Mm -hmm. bells would go off, and and literally every guy from the hardware store would haul ass across the street. Nanny would go down, man the the counter. You know what I mean? Yes. My my cousin Edward, my cousin Matthew, you know, we'd we'd take off and and watch. And they had some pretty epic jobs, too. You know, Cliffside Park was one of the early bowstring trust construction uh, fatals where the uh, bowling alley. Uh, you know, fell on those poor guys. And uh, my Uncle Matt actually died after a call. He came back. That was long before, you know, we had all the PSOB and all that. But my Uncle Matt, he came back from a run, told his wife she wasn't feeling well. And that was back in the days when you got in the car. Yes. She drove him over to the doctor's uh, uh, office. And he said, I'm tired. I want to lay down. And he laid down and passed away. You know, yeah. and so it was a, a different time, right? And, yeah. But the but buffing back then uh, was just, everybody did it, you know. You, yes. You, 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 back in the Bronx when I was a little guy for, hanging out on Hollywood Avenue, you know, if we'd see a column of smoke, you'd have every kid who had a bicycle, or, you know, tearing ass down the block or, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just to watch, to watch the guys work, you know. Yeah. The, I didn't realize it, but Martin Gruby reminded me um, after I started working for you, at the conferences that the first time he met me was with a bus full of guys from Virginia beach that came up to rescue one. And I, I didn't recall it, but there was so many people coming and going then. That 
Yeah. That's wow. great. Yeah, yeah. A lot of overlapping. Mm-hmm. Wow. And yeah. you know, so many of us, our paths, you know, just we bumped into each other in all kinds of crazy places and we don't even know it until we talk about having been somewhere. And then well, I was there. You know what yes. I mean? And you're like, yes. yes, really? I can't remember who yeah. I was talking to the other day, but we were talking about being out on Randall's Island. No, not Randall's Island, down on the rock. We're on the rock. And it was during the secret nozzle tests. Remember with Gansey and, and all that was going on? And, yes. uh, I, and, and he said to me, I was there. And I'm like, I don't remember. And he goes, he goes, Halton, you had like 150 people there. You know, it's like, we were everybody, every, Bagansi ordered all the chiefs to come down to that, that training, that demo that day, which was, you know, just amazing. He was a, he was a great guy. So let's talk. Again, he was a great guy. I worked for him on the side. I was banging oh. nails in a couple of houses he built. Okay. And then we would, I thought, I thought maybe ride into, uh, he was um, covering chief in the three, five battalion. And I was in 108 at the time and we were able to commute together. He had a oh. diesel Chevy Chevette. I think clanked and smoked. It was hilarious. That's what <laughs> Pete and I commuted in. The, the last time I, <laughs> last time I rode with him, we were in that little, uh, I want to say, it wasn't a Fiat. It was Alfa Romeo sports car. Remember the little sports car he had? I, I don't remember that. I just remember the diesel Chevette. It was hilarious. So he yeah. fit in it no problem. And I looked, oh, like, yeah. the, I looked like the guy <laughs> out of the James Bond movie, you know, with my head up over the thing. And, and he, he, uh, it was right after one of the nozzle deals. And we'd snuck off to Beth Page and got in a quick nine. And, yes. uh, and he drove me back to LaGuardia. And that yes. was like a couple of days before 9-11. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the last time I saw him, uh, great guy. Yeah. Uh, just a great guy. So you came in in 84. Yeah. Yes. Where did, uh, where did you, where'd you go to out of training? I was in uh, 227 uh, Engine Company in Brownsville on uh, Ralph Avenue between Bergen and Dean. I was in... Uh, I was only there for two years. I was in 108 truck um, from then, from uh, 86 to 90, and then Rescue One. Wow. Yeah, uh, very lucky. All the places that I worked were wonderful. Um, guys are great. Uh, I did details to other companies too. Short time in Hazmat. Um, there was a program that you had to go to Hazmat on a detail in order to get to a rescue. and. Uh, I went, and then I think they disbanded the program. I was the only guy who had to do it. What can you do? <laughs> and but those guys are so competent and knowledgeable, and I am not with hazmat. So basically, a roll of duct tape in one hand and a toilet brush in the other, and package them up, scrub them down. That was my whole hazmat experience. I got a, I got a buddy named Phil Ambrose who runs a company called HazSim. Great guy. They got yeah. a new website coming up and everything. And, and just like Greg Knoll, you know, when he starts talking to me about that stuff, I, I feel like they're talking another language. I'm like, yes. How do you guys keep all that? It, it, you so know, knowledgeable. Oh, yeah. That, both of them. Not just, me. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't my thing either. It wasn't yeah. my thing either. I, I used to call them. You know the where I see it? I always say that uh, confined space is where tech rescue meets hazmat. And um, I enjoy confined space work and training. And that broadened my uh, knowledge base and has met more researching the companies that we trained or different um, industries where I went. And uh, I didn't appreciate it enough when I was in FDNY. I learned more about it after I'd retired. But really? I enjoy it now. Yeah, mm, I enjoy it now. Confined space. Yeah. Okay, that's kind of weird coming from you. You know that, right? Because you're like, you're, like, you're like the biggest outdoors guy. Spring bean in the fire service if you don't know uh, kevin did a hunting and fishing series for years for us and uh, that was a lot of fun yeah. yeah the outdoor series that was great and now he lives in montana and he likes confined space yeah. you asked me what i was in school for before you got me um on this webcast what I'm is it? school on the computer i'm taking the uh, master hunter program in really montana. yeah so yeah. really I, I just started an online course a couple of days ago with Hillsdale College. I'm taking an American history course of all things. Oh, right? nice. Yeah. There's a shocker. Are you enjoying it? It's a great course. It's a great. Hillsdale College is the, uh, there are only two colleges in America that take no federal money. They're one of them. Okay. And, and, uh, I didn't know that. Wonderful school. Just an amazing school and a great, great teachers. So, so you, 
a couple of years on, uh, on an engine and a truck and then right and into rescue, rescue yes. one, huh? Yeah. Wow. And you know, um, my career, uh, unfortunately, um, was cut short uh, because of an accident. So then it was more, um, I stayed for a while. I was uh, blessed, fortunate enough to get promoted lieutenant afterwards. And then I retired, had to retire. Um, and I gravitated more. When I went to the rescue company, uh, although I was intrigued with technical rescue and I enjoyed it, I really wanted as much fire as I could get. That's why I went. And the rescue companies went to all the, the fires. So it was all about, uh, yeah, I was young and, you know, super motivated. It was all about the fires. And I enjoyed the tech rescue, but I just wanted as much fire as I could get. And the rescues went to more than the engines and trucks. So that's where I wanted to go. Well, they had, they had I, I didn't appreciate the tech rescue as much as I do now until after I retired because I still like to teach Bobby and be around the guys, you know? And um, it's hard because uh, I'm not a teacher, I'm, you know, an instructor. It's not the same level. I can't professionally teach a class. But I'm in, is instructing another one, like the guys I remember from the academy. And um, if I can't do it hands-on, it's hard for me to articulate, you know, the message properly. But that's the best training we get in this industry is the hands-on. Yes. I mean, we need, we need all the background. We need to understand the terminology. We need to understand the theory. And there's some of us that need to get, but, but 90% of us need to understand the physical manipulation of our tools yes. and equipment in practice, not, not in theory. You know, it's the old Yogi oh. Berra line. Uh, people, yeah. people tell me sometimes that theory and practice are the same, but in practice, they're not. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. But the firefighting for me, although it was my passion, and I won't lie, I, I, it was more fun. I enjoyed it more than the tech rescue, although I do like the tech rescue. I enjoy the firefighting more. But when you're out of the game for a long time, if I teach, you could become stale or locked in older techniques. The basics don't change, and I'm a big proponent of, um, you know, uh, mastering the basics. But the tech rescue now, I can uh, practice out in my barn. I'm lifting kayaks onto the roof, uh, wrangling my goats outside. I, I can have a blast, but I can be proficient with my ropes and knots, more than I was back in the day. I can be proficient with a tripod. Proficient sure. with that equipment, confined space, because I can practice it where, you know, how do I practice engine truck company operations hard? I can go to an academy, but that element of um, not knowing everything, the variables that are in a real building that should be removed at an academy, I can't reproduce those, Bobby. So actually my training, although I still do teach some basic engine truck company operations and I enjoy it very much, um, I can actually, what some people thought was more advanced than tech rescue, is actually easier for me to practice um, out in the field. I can make a tech rescue drill very close to a real industrial accident or a real you know, um, utility accident. And I can get super close and mimic what I'm trying to do. Firefighting, if you're out of it for a long time, Bobby, uh, it's harder to do that, you know what I mean? Uh, still can be done, but I'm not comfortable myself telling a guy, look, this is how you have to do it. If I haven't done it in 20 years, I don't think it's huh? fair to my student where my exactly tech right. rescue can be spot on if I'm not lazy and I <laughs> practice enough. You know? Well, that's ancient wisdom. It was, uh, I think, uh, I'm going to screw it up. I think it was Seneca. You no, know, I'll yeah. think of it. But he said, uh, those who do should talk and only those who do should talk. Yes. And, and that meant if you're going to sure. instruct or teach, you should be doing it. And, but with tech rescue, you can do it, right? You, you can do it anywhere because you can practice. recreate. You can right. recreate the environment for it. Yes, right. absolutely. Right. right. And structural firefighting—it's a radically different deal. I'm, I'm very blessed. I've got a volunteer company here that lets me kick around with them, and well, that's and, wonderful. Yeah, you know, it's it's marvelous. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and they're really—it's a really solid, well-developed group of, of, of organizations. It's not just one organization. It's—they've um, got a great. They had a great thing going here, and they do a wonderful job. They're not—they're—they're uh, 
and they train relentlessly. They're, they're just really good people. So I'm blessed mm -hmm. in that regard. So you're early on in rescue. And I know a lot of people ask you about this all the time because you're involved mm -hmm. in one of the most famous rescues of all time, at least yeah. for our generation. And, and with some of the most famous guys of all time. Well, you're, you know that that rescue, um, they could say, is one of the most famous rescues. It was a lucky picture. You know that, Bobby. That, that is performed, you know, however many times, a couple of times a year, once or twice a year. Hopefully not too often because <laughs> it means everything else failed. But um, that, that rescue uh, was performed at other times and just wasn't cool. Oh, I, yeah. Mike Dugan has a very similar, you know, Dugan's rescue in 90, was yeah. it 90, 93 or 97, 93, uh, 93, 91. I think the same year. Nin uh, maybe yeah. 91. Right. Yes. right. Yes. He rescued Pablo Martinez off a fifth story yeah. window. Yours, yeah. yours was a bit higher. Just, mm -hmm. you don't mind if you wouldn't mind, take us back. Can you take us back to that day and tell the story? No, I don't, don't I don't mind. Um, uh, by the way, before I, I'll tell you that, I will tell you something ironic and funny about the rescue companies. I always wanted to be a fireman since I was a kid in high school and all that. And uh, because of controversy and lawsuits, although I scored the top of my list, I didn't get hired in 81, I got hired in 84. The test before me was held up in court for other reasons and so be it. I was in the first class off my list, I was happy. But I had some real high skilled jobs before I, uh, was a fireman. Basically, I dug ditches for the local utility company, take the dirt out, put the dirt back. I was in gas and electric underground. I can't tell you how badly I wanted to be a fireman, couldn't wait. And I swore that although I knew I'd only be a middle class guy, I was not going to own another freaking shovel. I said, I'm not <laughs> digging a hole. I'm going to pay a dude to do my landscaping. And I'm done. No more jackhammers, no more shovels, no more digging bars. And then I spend my entire career struggling, kicking and screaming, clawing to get into the only one of five companies that's got jackhammers and shovels. And shovels, right. right. I just was destined to be in dirt. <laughs> so that's my rescue uh, motivation. I used, to, I used to come home from school, show my old man my report card. Back then we had report cards. And he yeah, used yeah. to say, thank God for government work. Yeah, brother. They're always, they're always going to need a guy to dig those ditches. You know? That's right. A man with so, a shirt. yeah, I always thought that was kind of ironic. Uh, uh, go to the only companies with jackhammers when that's all I did as a kid before I was a fireman, work a jackhammer. Yeah, you know, I, you know but, uh, I've always been a huge fan of Mike Rowe and people like that because the, for me, like I'm one of those guys, I, I love to mow my yard. And when I get done, I stand there and I, I admire it. Like, yeah, it's the gratification. It looks good yeah, as soon as you're right. done, right? Look what I yeah. did. You know, yeah. I'm that old guy. I'm that old guy in the neighborhood. With, hey, check out yep. my yard, right? But, <laughs> right? but but there's a you know doing physical labor for me is so rewarding. I, I just uh, I, yes. whether I'm in my garden, working on my cars, working in my yard, on the job, yes. cleaning the rigs, squaring away the you know the apparatus floor, or you know setting up for a drill. Or I love doing that. Taking out you know cleaning out the tool shed a couple two three times a year and you know, making sure we got blades and, you know, oil. And I just love that kind of stuff. So yeah. take us back. The garden in the outside my house, I find that that kind of work is very mindful. You're paying attention to what you're doing. It helps if you're distracted or too much going on. It's, uh, I think it's good for your nugget, mental health, you know. I, I love it. I love it. I, I love it, man. I'll tell you, it's a, it's a, it's a blessing to be able to do that, which is kind of funny because you're talking to two New York, two, two, Born in New York, two kids born in New York. Yes. One's out, yeah. one's out north of Tulsa, and the other one's in Montana. You know, yep. what I mean? so yep. it's like it, we all should have those little eye patches, like the guy was it, what, Snake uh, Snake Stiltskin from uh, Kurt Russell escaped from yeah. New York. I'm yeah. the only dude that retired from New York and went someplace colder, right? Right, right. You're the only one who went in the wrong. Everybody place. else goes to Florida and North Carolina. Right, right. I kind of just went straight across. I'm like, you know, yeah, I'm out here. I, I interrupted you. you you asked about um yeah i want to take, take us back to that day to you know who you were with and what went down what was it all about how the job unfold yeah it was um uh it was myself and uh actually um and this is not because you're calling me but i keep a picture on my desk from my friends i don't know if you can see it from that day uh, can you make that out or is it too much glare? No, no, it's really good. I can see Patty. I see you. I see. Yeah. Yep. Right, right. Those are the guys that were involved. 
and uh, um, actually a hard luck picture because I'm looking at three passed away um, from 9-11. Uh, two of us were uh, hurt uh, line of duty um, and had to retire. And then it leaves two other guys and uh, one still on the job and one retired healthy. So out of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys in that picture, one we hope will retire healthy. Um, oh, he is. Ray, Ray didn't retire yet, did he? No, he's close. Yeah. He's so close. we hope Ray retires healthy and um, Patty Barr is retired. And the other two had to go out. Me, myself, and Bruce Newberry had to leave from injuries. And uh, Patty O'Keefe and um, Patty Brown, of course, and Kevin Dowdell was detailed to us from Rescue 2 that day, and they all passed away uh, 9 11. So, yeah. A couple of pictures of that, and one or two others I keep around with a group of guys from memorable times on my desk, you know. But um, so that day, um, I'd never met Patty Barr before um, from 43 Truck, I believe, up in uh, Harlem. And uh, Kevin Dowdell, of course, I knew Kevin from Brooklyn. Uh, he was a rescue too. He was uh, detailed for the day. I think um, Patty may have been on overtime. And then it was myself. Uh, Patty Brown, Bruce Newberry, uh, Patty O'Keefe, and um, Ray McCormick wasn't with us that day. He showed up on the roof. Uh, he was in the truck company. Um, and uh, it's funny, it's ironic that uh, the rescue company at the time, again, I might be telling you things that are outdated, so please bear with me. But uh, we carried two roof ropes, and the truck companies carried one. And uh, right when Patty Barr came into the kitchen, introduced himself. I said, hello, we were drinking coffee. We used to repack the um, uh, roof rope on the kitchen floor because the kitchen was clean, it was tile, no, no abrasives, nothing, oil stains, whatever, that would degrade a rope. And so we were in the middle, uh, I had just opened up one of the roof ropes, it was all over the kitchen floor. And the call came and we left. So we only had one rope with us. But that's fine because you only needed one. We only used one, but we always had an alternate. So when you're repacking one, you have the other. You don't repack them both at the same time, you know. Right. So I thought that was kind of funny, bit of trivia. One of the ropes was back all over the kitchen. Um, and we went to a different call. I don't remember what it was, but we went out on a run for something. And um, uh, I don't remember everybody's position, but to say that, uh, you know, when the second call came in before we returned to quarters, we went on the road, we responded. And um, for some reason, I think it was a Tuesday. Yeah. It came in um, late morning, uh, 11 o'clock, 1030, something like that call came in. And uh, uh, 47th and 7th, I believe was the corner the building was on. And um, it's not, if a company goes and just does whatever they want, because we're so structured in FDNY, that would be called freelancing. And I'm not a fan of that. It's a disaster. If you see something that you want to do, that means you might have neglected something that you're supposed to do. And it, you know what I mean? It's, we don't operate like that. FDNY uh, is very regimented in guys' positions, and it works like clockwork. I'm a big fan of how I operated. Uh, so when we pulled up, um, there was a guy at the window, basically. Uh, and the chief just pointed to us and said, go get that guy. Like, that's yours. That was it. So I only knew there was one person uh, showing. Apparently, it was on the 12th floor. But at the time, we didn't, you know, didn't know that. I just ran out, looked up, and uh, oh, there he is. And um, uh, his name was Jose Gallegos. Great guy. I stayed in touch with him. Uh, and myself and Kevin Dowdell, um, were, uh, I can't remember if I had the irons that day. Anyway, long story short, uh, we, I didn't, I was outside team because Kevin and I were together. So that would have been, uh, outside team, but Patty Brown took, and we had to go, uh, I'm jumping all over the place a little bit. We had to go, um, up the exterior stairs. That building had a fire stair which was an enclosed staircase that ran the whole height of the building. Like and an old fashioned smoke tower, huh? Yes. It was enclosed by brick masonry. Right. Uh, 
and it went all the way up. Um, and so what we were doing back then, it wasn't set in stone, but basically the first two engine would get in an elevator. Second two engine might throw their hose, their roll ups off their shoulder into the elevator. And then they would go up and now they could kick, you know, to the floor below, they could kick out the second two's hose for them. So those guys just had to go up the stairs, but their hose, their, their equipment was waiting for them. And the first two went to work. So we had to hoof it up. And I remember we were wearing what we called at the time high rise bottles, the heavier bottle, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I remember. So pre loaded up our hand tools, and uh, it was 12 stories up. And that was mill construction, the term that they used from back in the day when uh, knitting mills and all were, you know, in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So those were not 10 foot ceilings, those were meant could have been 15 foot ceilings and it was a long it was a long way up those stairs <laughs> just getting to the top of those stairs i was shot uh then we had um an outward opening commercial door but uh, we had a force that was locked and um we were banging away on that door kevin and i and um the two three patrick's patty brown patty bar patty o'keefe three patrick's went past us up the uh, stairs to the roof. So just as we were forcing the door, the engine company was right behind us, they were with us. And it was a lot of work to get that door open. Just as we finished forcing the door, just get a gap, you know, because the door's op outward opening, and just get the gap, and then you're, you're working it now. You got it, but it's still a little bit to get it open. And the engine's got water, water behind us, and um, just as we're about to finish the door, Patty uh, Brown is calling for urgent. He didn't say May Day. He said Mer urgent manpower needed on the roof. Boom, the door comes open. And uh, Kevin Aldell says, I'm going to go get him through, through uh, the smoke. And I said, I'm going up to the roof. So it was a split decision. Either one was right or wrong. What do you do? Kevin's going right for the guy, which is the right thing to do. We forced the door right there. But I'm hearing, you know, urgent manpower on the roof. And I said, well, Kevin, I'll get the guy. I don't know if a guy just stepped through the roof. And not long before that, I'd been to a job where a guy put his foot through the roof. And it goes like Chinese fingers. Right. His leg goes down. And there's a top floor fire. His leg goes down, but he can't pull his leg out. Right. Well, if the fire is right below you, you burn, burn it, you know, badly. So right. that particular guy, the fire had not gone through the ceiling. So it was not in the cock loft. He got his leg out, but it was close where he would have been terribly burned. That was just boom. So when I hear man pound a roof, urgent, I, I left. So Kevin and I split up. And now, you know, physically, you're just exhausted. And so I, I stumble into the middle of a roof rope operation. Like, dang, <laughs> here we go. So, uh, and there were a lot of things I really admired that day. A lot of things didn't go well, but they, you know, they just go and you make it work. And, um, uh, Patty Barr was already in the rope, in the um, boy on a bike and the hitch on him. Uh, Patty O'Keefe had uh, tied him up and I was looking for a substantial object. But when I came onto the roof, first thing I do is immediately took off my coat, my helmet, because I was overheated. It was a hot, it was May, it was late May, but it was hot. The real hot, it was in the 90s. And uh, you know, where you get lag headed, you just can't, you, you, you need a rest, but there's no rest. You got to keep going. So it was 12 stories of stairs, outward opening door. Now this, right? So you take care of everything because you're overheated. And uh, I was wearing a harness. I had just been issued a harness. The truck companies and the rescues were getting harnesses. Um, and uh, Patty O'Keefe didn't have one yet. So the rope comes with the ladder belt, uh, but it was easier to use the harness. That's why I ended up being the anchor for Patty Barr, because O'Keefe didn't have a harness and I did. Uh, they ha he hadn't been issued one yet. So I immediately put the rope, uh, you know, a couple of laps on that big hook. Uh, but we're looking for a substantial object. And that building um, had a, it was a penthouse, but it was actually like almost another story because all it had was a, uh, an alleyway between the parapet wall and the other building went all the way up and it was masonry. It was just wow. solid brick. So now there's no substantial object. There was a small air conditioning unit 
but not a big commercial one. They put a small one in, just let's say to air condition one office in that penthouse, but it wasn't a uh, real unit. It was a small unit. I just ran over to it, kicked it. You know, the cover fell off. And I'm like, an iffy substantial object is no substantial object, you know? So I looked around. There was nothing else to do. Now, at this point, Patty Barr had already hung himself, to show you, you know, the nerve, the bravery of that guy, hung himself off the parapet wall and was on the wall like this with his arms to give the uh, fellow Jose Gallegos um, confidence, yeah, not to jump. He was going to jump. Now he's in the window, and they got footage of it somewhere, with his arms against you know the sides of the window to hold himself. He's praying in Spanish. This guy's going to jump. The smoke is right behind him. It's getting hot. He, I mean, he looked to me like he was going to jump. And Patty Barr did a fantastic thing by doing that. You gotta understand this picture that show Patty Barr hanging like that and me not even having the rope on me yet. Or I've got, I can't tell if I have the rope on or not, but I'm not even sitting down. I'm looking for an object to tie off to, there's nothing. So when I see Patty's gonna go and Patty Brown is just yelling, we're out of time. And then that was it. Uh, I just sat down, put my feet up against the parapet wall, um, took the slack out. And then just did the, you know, the four loops on the big, whether it's a ladder hook, whatever you say, an oversized carabiner, four hooks is enough friction to lower a guy and pick up another guy. And um, just as I'm starting to, as Patty Barr's starting to go down, when he picks Jose up, and you'll see that Jose couldn't wait, jumped to him. You see that rope going down real quick. Well, that's us on the other end going up. That's a static rope that's not a dynamic rope there's no pull to it and right. just as that happened both patty o'keefe and bruce newberry reached the roof and they jumped in across my my waist and my chest and pulling me back down so um you also you'll notice uh patty Barr was very strong powerful man probably physically stronger than me and you'll see just the luck of how everything worked out that it wasn't me going first, it was Patty Barr going first. Um, he caught, I mean, he goes past Jose, Jose just jumps. Talk about tech rescue today, two ropes on the rescuer, two ropes on the victim, a heart, a whole that dude is in Patty's arms and his leg lock around the guy. That's it. <laughs> and you know, uh, that's all that could be done. And we don't second guess because there's nothing to be learned from uh, finger pointing. Are there things I wish I could have done better? I would like to do a lot of things different. That day, it was that or nothing. It worked out just fine. Um, so Patty Barr reaches the window. They get pulled in. And just as they're getting pulled in, we didn't realize it, but another person, a fellow named Peter Lewis, showed up on the other side of the building. And uh, so we're yelling at Patty to get out of the rope as quick as he can. He doesn't realize we're about to perform another rescue. And uh, we pull the rope up as fast as we can, but I'm already hooked into the rope because I had lowered um, Patty Barr. So I just stayed hooked in to the rope and I was preparing to go over the other side. And as I was preparing to go over the other side, uh, the truck company showed up. Uh, thank God the truck showed up. We have more manpower now. And Kevin Dowdell showed up too at the same time. Uh, and Ray McCormick, I believe was wearing a harness. I don't think he used a belt. I believe he was wearing a harness. And uh, Patty uh, Brown was still there and directed that one. And then that's what, uh, how they lowered me. And then uh, I was fortunate. That's the first time I ever met Ray McCormick was as he was about to lower me. I'm like, are you ready? <laughs> He's like, yeah, okay. And that was that. Uh, um, and then, um, so Ray is in your position with his feet up against the parapet and guys. Yeah. Him. Yeah. But it was, I felt better about it because uh, there was a lot more manpower at this point And I felt confident that they would either hold Ray at the time or he would find an object to tie off to, which I believe they held him. Uh, yeah, they held, but, they held uh, him. What's that? Yeah. They held him. Yeah. They held him. There were more people. It was good. It, everything was going well. Um, uh, also in addition to that, um, I had better control over, I don't like to say the victim, victim 
makes the other guy sound like a point of weakness. The guy I was helping, I had better control and time over him. So you'll see that I had longer. He didn't jump out at me. I yelled at him right away not to. I got down to him and I had him climb on me slowly. So he had his legs up around my waist and I had a, a very tight grip on him. I was much more uh, confident of, of the grip. I didn't see what had happened, but when I saw the pictures later about how um, Jose jumped on Patty Barr, it was tough. I had a better situation, but I could see, um, I could see fire at the top of the door behind him. And we were concerned, you know, to get it done quickly. So no heat was, uh, the rope wasn't exposed to any heat. Um, but uh, it went, I think it went smoother the second time because of the way Peter Lewis climbed onto me. I had a, a distinct advantage. Patty Barr had it tougher. Uh, well, but there's that, the iconic photo of you dangling together. <laughs> yeah. It's just, a, it's just iconic. I mean, it's, you know, everybody, everyone knows the photo. I mean, yeah. it's universally um, admired. And, and that whole event is universally admired, not just for the, uh, and as you said, not for any kind of, for the courage and, and the innovation and the, uh, and the focus. Do you ever hear why there was such great pictures of that? that no. Night? So just by coincidence, no rescue one did not plan it and did not hire a film crew ahead of time. I've heard that before. Um, Mayor Dinkins and Governor Cuomo were scheduled to have a the meeting of Governor some sort a, an hour later, right there, or right in that area. There were professional film crews. You've seen the, the news. They run around in the vans, the heavy duty van. They just yeah. open up the side door and out come the cameras. There were professional film crews, more than one station, on the corner, eating hot dogs, waiting, you know, for this conference with Dinkins and Cuomo. And that's why there was such good coverage. Mm. That's the reason why there was so many photos taken. Mm. Imagine if I would have dropped that guy in front of all those cameras. I don't think I'd be too popular right now, Bobby. No, they'd be saying, hey, let's talk to Kevin Shea. They'd be saying, that's the guy we couldn't get a raise for 20 years for the union because he killed him in front of everybody. Cause he, cause How do you know? It, you do your best and the outcome was good that day. You never know, but that's, you can't only perform when you know the outcome. You just got to go no matter what, right? Well, and I think, <laughs> you know, it, it, it certainly wasn't a textbook, technical rescue, rope rescue, but no. what it did show was people who understood the parameters that they were operating under and were able to compensate for the lack of state, you know, yes. anchors, manpower, you know, that when you have to improvise, it's about the, it was about, it was about Mr. Gallegos and yes, it, Mr. Lewis. It, it, that's who it was about. It wasn't yeah. about us, but you know, lots of times people say we come first. Well, not actually. No, we don't. No, I don't believe that at all. We no, come I, very important, but if we came first, I, this is going to sound terrible. No, uh, I'm not going to get in trouble for this podcast. No. <laughs> hey, we, we both if already got really think you know, What are they going to do? Take away our birthdays? That's right. If you think you're more important than the public, you're in the wrong line of work. I agree. Public servants, we're here to serve. And um, there's other areas to serve in the public where you don't actually maybe put your life in danger. You're a police officer, you're a firefighter, you're an EMS. You're saying that not only is the uh, public more important than I am, but um, if I have to, you know, jeopardize my well-being to save another, that's our line of work. And uh, I wish it could be done as safely as possible. The push comes to shove, you know, you got you to gotta go. Yeah, and, and none of us are saying we'd throw our lives away foolishly. We'll take every no. precaution. No, we no. Can. But we'll, the, the whole idea is that we put ourselves at tremendous risk because that makes people assured that there's a safety net, that there are people who are in times of peril and danger are yes. going to do that so that they don't jump from those windows. You know, they yes. know that, that, that some young Kevin Shea is out there who's yes. going to be willing to tie off and, and, and try to make that grab, you know, and, and, and we can't well, make every grab. But no, well, no, but, uh, you know, from all the things that we did, we're that they might shot. say were uh, things we did in the past that they say we didn't, weren't operating safe enough or what have you, 
we were operating with what we were taught at the time. And if you could look back at things that we did and say, I can do it better, wonderful. God bless you. I wish a firefighter was never killed again ever. But are we more important than the public? No. We're second to the public. You know, it's always good to look back at events and, and look at what you could do differently or whatever. Yes. But you have yeah. to remember, especially when you get years removed, that technology improves and, and the accumulated knowledge from those experiences is what helps you to have the ability yes. to say, well, they could have done this. Well, yeah, great. Well, we didn't know that at the time. Right. We didn't have that at the time, you know, and, no. and so we I did the I, best with what we had. Yeah. I thought it was a wonderful rescue. I thought it was a, <laughs> I thought it was a great example of, because so many rescues, well, you take, take Mike's rescue of Pablo yes. Martinez. No, no, no film crew was able to catch that. Right. First of all, cause it happened so late at night and what, yes. whatnot, but that's an amazing rescue also, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Two, two, two firefighters in a pipe pole. Five stories yeah. up, you know, and, and they yeah. pull it off, right? And, yes. And, and, you know, and if, if, that, if, the, if the pipe pole had busted, Mike and, and Pablo would have tumbled five stories to the ground. Mm. And, and, but Mike understood that. You understood that. If, if that fire had yes. blown out that window, that rope could have gone in a matter of minutes yeah. or less. And so, yes. you know, I think the assumed risk of the job is something that people need to be more honest with when, when kids sign up and you don't have to be an FDNY or Denver or LA or, you know, any of these, you could be in the smallest community you could imagine and, and still have to do, you know, something incredibly heroic and dangerous and, and really well, exhibit. Yeah. We're not paid for, we're not really paid for what we do. You know, we're paid for what we might have to do, you know, yeah. Day to day, I'm sure you could get somebody to wash the fire truck and clean the kitchen, do the maintenance a lot cheaper than a fireman's salary. But if you are doing what you're supposed to do and you kept yourself in great physical shape, mental shape, and you're prepared, then you're worth your weight in gold when the time comes. And that's that's the job, you know. Well, on the other side of it too is the you know, and many folks you know get angry at guys like you and I because we demand a lot of drill and training. Yeah. Because it, you don't have time, you know, like, like when Patty started yelling urgent, you don't have no. time to tell anybody how to tie off or how to hook up or they just have, you just, you just have to be able to do it in your sleep with your gloves on. You're an automatic pilot. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. And you gotta you know, be thinking about, you gotta be thinking three steps ahead. Yeah. That's, that's something I try and talk about now when I talk to younger guys and girls too in the field it was uh, the two things I, I hammer are, are training and safety. And the training, I'm a big on basic stuff. Not that you shouldn't know every fancy knot and all, but you got to be able to give me a three to one or a four to one, even if you're uncomfortable, even if you're shot, even if you, you know, your, your arm is broken and maybe they're trying to rescue you and they lower you the rope. You, you got to perform these basic things. And that's what I guess if there was a lesson to learn from that rescue was um, I had two of the Higgins family, several firemen there, wonderful family. And Eddie Higgins was my captain in 227 engine. And Michael Higgins, his son, was a senior to me in 108 trucks. I always say I learned my engine company from the Higgins and I learned my truck company from the Higgins. Wow. Michael was wonderful. And even when guys were tired and, and you know, come in from work on a second job, and Michael was so gung ho. He's like, this is not a part time job. This is your career. And if you can't drill, quit your other job. And he was real motivated. It was great. And one of the things that we would practice sometimes when the officers had a lot of paperwork and stuff to do at the time, the fire reports were becoming more involved. So, you know, we could practice. Sometimes we drill, doing BI, you would drill, doing other things you would drill. But if the officer couldn't take us out, we would drill right in quarters or near quarters. And the senior guys would run the drill. And uh, sometimes we'd take the uh, 108 was a rear mount take the aerial right out in front of the firehouse and practice raising it, lowering it because we had the, the L, the elevated railroad on Broadway. We were on the corner of Union and Broadway, so you could position a rig in different spots and practice putting up the aerial. Or we could do the, the roof rope, especially in bad weather, roof rope, up and down the pole hole. And it got drilled into me like rope memory, you know. Throw 10 pounds of you know what against the wall, you hope five pounds stick. Just keep throwing it, throwing it. So... I was not in the rescue company a year when that rescue came. Where do you think my training for that particular 
was 108 truck. That was Mike Higgins. Funny, I was wearing a 108 shirt that day, so I caught a lot of flack from that from the rescue guys, but the 108 guys were happy. But that's what it's about. It's about practicing. So it can be, uh, you, like I say, you practice the basics until they become advanced. Well, if it's a basic roof rope operation, but you can do it blindfolded after going up 12 stories in the heat, after forcing you out with opening door, not knowing what's going on, and walk right into the middle of it. Do you think that's me being a super heads up fireman? No, that's the practice and the rope memory. So I hammer my practice, keeping it simple. When you've mastered that, then step your game up. But to try and do advanced things, to, you know, to show off or show people how special you are. I, I joke with the students, like, your mother lied to you. You're not special. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, and no. all about basic stuff. You know what I mean? Basics yeah. get us. It's a basic job, firefighter. Oh, yeah. Get you through it, you know? I had a kid the other day, younger than my youngest son, mm -hmm. showed me a couple of things the other day. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty good stuff there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And he goes, really? I said, yeah, I didn't know how to do that. And sure. And I'm like, fantastic. And the kid's been, I don't know, volunteering for two or three years. That's but, great. Yeah, he's a great kid. You know, we're, we're doing a little, he showed me a little drafting trick. And I'm like, that's freaking brilliant, man. I, yeah. I never saw you. Know, I was like, damn. And he goes, well, my dad showed me and his dad showed him. And now I'm showing you. Showing yeah. somebody's grandfather, you know. Like, yes, yes. Teaching the old guy, the old, the old rookie. So, uh, but you're right. And it's, it, there's no, all the, all the advanced stuff is, is just a, compilation of a whole bunch of the basics kind of cobbled together you know what i mean and all oh, it is maybe ropes and pulleys like when did the vikings invade england on their ships with ropes and pulleys when did they build the pyramids with four to one pulleys lifting stone i mean there's nothing new you uh, know no, we have no. fancier pulleys with cool names and you know coming neat colors from our rock climbing friends and we have all kinds of gadgets for descending advices but it's it's a rope it's a pulley. It's friction. It's Pretty nothing. Big forward stuff. Nothing. So, so then fast forward 93, World Trade Center. Yes. You get hurt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I, uh, well, that's, um, that's the other part sometimes of the talk I give to people. Training and uh, safety. And uh, um, that, that day, uh, I... I survived in spite of myself. <laughs> I, I did. Uh, so safety, right? I was in some ways, uh, especially after some things happened to you, I was becoming a safety, for myself, a safety disaster. We were so, I don't know if it's competitive or... Uh, you know, like a dog wanting to be pet. You were so looking for the approval of the other guys you worked with, especially in the rescue company, to show them that you were giving 110%. You would cut any corner to improve your performance, mm -hmm. any corner. So some of it is not being irresponsible. Some of it you could see in coming from FDNY, just like I wouldn't tell you or your neighbors what to do in their response area. I don't know your target hazards. You know your job. I don't know it. But for mine, outside guys, OV, roof, a lot of times didn't wear pull-up boots. We didn't have bunker gear. We wear work boots, right? But I couldn't negotiate the fire, fire escapes and things like that quick enough with those heavy boots. Engine, everybody wore the pull-up boots, of course. And in the truck and in the rescue, a lot of times the inside team did. Your uh, can man and your hook and, and your irons guy. But outside guys, OV and roof wore work boots, that type of thing. Um, I had a coat from the volunteers that had the liner was disintegrated. It was so lightweight. It was lighter than a Carhartt work jacket. I wore that. I wore my old, you know, my helmet because we only had one, but they were replacing them with the new helmets, but the new helmets were heavy. Now guys joke about, well, I like my old helmet because nostalgia looked all burnt up. No, I like my old helmet because it was lighter. The other one was heavy. Um, I'm tall, but I'm skinny. So whenever I bend over in a coat and the coats didn't come fit like today, they weren't as good, you know? So my coat, I always wore a, um, a sweatshirt, if it wasn't too hot with a hood. 
I wore the hood because I'm tall and I'm skinny and it didn't come with narrow shoulders. So every time I bend over, stuff, embers would go down my coat, down my neck and burn. I had little burns on my back. So I wore a hoodie sweatshirt because the hood filled the gap. Then you could just pull the hood and it shook stuff out. You know what I mean? I didn't get plastered down my neck. So a lot of it looks irresponsible, but if you ask somebody why they're doing it, there's a reason to what you're doing. You know? Well, we, <laughs> we had inspection time. And an inspection, once a year annual inspection, you had to have all your gear perfect. Well, supposedly, you didn't get your check. Nobody, no chief ever did that to us. But in general, you had to pass inspection. So I had my proby coat, big, heavy rubber coat, immaculate, you know, I kept it in my locker. We had two lockers in rescue. It was like hermetically sealed. You never opened that, that locker, right? All my right crap, proper uniform, everything was in there. <laughs> and I only used it for inspection. I wore any old junk that was as light as possible. Well, we had gotten new helmets, much heavier. And they gave you a choice, chin strap or a ratchet device on the back where you just tighten it like on a hard hat. Right. The ratchet device on the back. They told us if you're caught wearing your old helmet, we're going to take it from you. Now, they couldn't take your old helmet because this is before the quartermaster. I paid for that helmet. That's my helmet. But long story short, you're going to somehow get in trouble. We didn't listen. You start to listen. The lieutenant's getting flack. So now it's rolling downhill. Now I'm getting flack. And, you know, first to resist it, but eventually like, oh, I don't want the lieutenant getting in trouble. So, yeah, I wear the right helmet, which I didn't like. Um, the coat, my coat uh, was, I, I was on overtime the day of the Trade Center. And that was a Friday afternoon. And my coat was soaking wet. So uh, what do you do when your gear is soaking wet? From the night before I worked, what do I do? I wear my friend's gear. And I get his stuff all wet, right? That's what I did. Now his stuff's soaking wet. It's freezing cold. It's in February. It's snowing. And uh, finally, which I hate to do, I went and got all the right gear out of my locker. Why? Because I was cold and I was wet. But I'd already got my friend's stuff soaking wet. He was going to be pissed when he came in. But what can you do? We did that to each other. I'm wearing the right coat. I'm wearing the right helmet, which I would never have worn. Right? When I fell, we, we had gotten a report of a transformer explosion. And uh, long story short, we went into the Vista Hotel which by 9-11 was no longer the Vista. I think it was a Marriott, but it was the Vista Hotel when we were there in 90, uh, 93. And um, we went in and something wasn't right. So the Vista Hotel was between the two towers. So we go into the Vista Hotel and the uh, fire watch guy had left his post. He was gone. Somebody else is yelling, uh, the stairs are over there, go downstairs. We're just shrugging. We had no sense of urgency because it's just a transformer explosion. These things go off all the time. Now, some of the civilians might be yelling and screaming, but they yelled and screamed anyway. And, you know, just, I thought it was pretty going to be routine. All of a sudden, we get down into the, one level down the basement, B1, several basement levels. The B1 level, and early on, you knew something wasn't right. It was a light haze of smoke, uh, but, uh, had an odd smell to it. Couldn't place it right away. Um, we're looking around. We split up. And uh, as I'm going by, uh, I'm in an office area downstairs, the B1 level. And it had those cubicles where the bottom half of it is like metal, but the top half is a window, you know, to, to divide the cubicles. And I'm looking and, and it's like something's weird. Everybody's gone. Everybody evacuated. There's a safe. And there's cash and like, I guess there were bearer bonds all over. And I'm like, what's going on? It's almost like a robbery. The safe is wide open. A small safe at the size of one of my desk, wide open. The guy, whoever it was, the guy or the woman didn't even kick it closed and spin the dial. The people don't do that. Then I got my officer yelling. I got somebody and I left this scene and I'm saying, hey, you know, there's a safe wide open thinking something's wrong, you know. And he brings us into a locker room. And it was a men's locker room and the lockers are all knocked over. But the windows and the mirrors by the sinks are not busted. The glass in the cubicles is not broken. So what happened that people shove these lockers open and you know, you can't push lockers over. They're bolted to the ground. Like stuff's not clicking yet. I, I can't pick it up because as you're experienced, you're supposed to bring these things into your mind 
and come up with a solution without even thinking about it, right? Well, the lieutenant's going, and all of a sudden there's some rubble. He's looking through a hole in a wall, um, Jack McAllister, and he says, uh, I can't get him this way, find another way. We're in single file now. So we're about face. Now I'm in front. We leave the locker room. I go to a, uh, a door or out of this office area to a wall. And the floor, I call it like polished concrete, had like an epoxy or something on it. So it was a, it was a finished but concrete floor. No tile, no carpet. I open this door and it's banked pitch black right to the floor. Black, black, and arid, choking you right away, right? I'm like, wow. So I shut the door. And then I said, I, I got a job here. I open the door again, I'm yelling in, and I can hear a voice yelling back. I shut the door again, I got Gary Guidel with me, who was my partner, and I'm yelling, I got him, we got a guy here, we gotta go this way. We open the door again, put our masks on, and uh, start to crawl out, because we were down low, and there's no change in the floor, there's no slope, there's no step down. There's no carpet to tile, tile to, it's the same floor right out. So what do you think? You think you're in a hallway, right? right. That's what you would think. Right. I was in a hallway. I was on a ramp of the parking garage, but mm -hmm. I didn't know it. I, I think I'm in a hallway. Pitch black, can't see anything. So we're breathing and have to use our mask, which you used to try not to use, to save it to when you needed it, you know? Cheating, using a cheater, you know, right. breathing, lifting it up. I know it keeps get a lot of flack now and people more educated about cancer and what have you. I get it. And I, I agree with it. But at the time we were not as aware of those diseases. Right, know, so you were, saving, you were saving air. I was saving air to use it when I needed it. Right. Well, so done. we'd lift the face piece and yell the guy. And then when you're doing your search, a lot of times, you know, it's single file, you know, one guy on the floor, next guy behind him on the wall, next guy behind him. We're moving. So I got Gary on the wall. I'm next to Gary. That way I cover a wider area. You know, if Gary's got the wall, I got Gary. We're going down. We're trying to move. We're not crawling anymore because we're on poor concrete floor, foot and a half thick concrete. It's like a class A highway. Uh, we think we're in the basement of the Trade Center. And as we're getting closer to the guy's voice, we start to see orange through the black and feel some crunchy stuff under our feet a little bit. And I'm like, Gary, I, you know, I'm yelling to the guy, hey, Gary, you know, we're coming, we're going to get you. And I put my face back on, I turn to Gary and say, I don't think we can get this guy. Because all I'm thinking is transform a fire still, and there's a lot of fire, now there's orange through the black between me and the voice. So I'm like, I think we need a line, you know. And I didn't know what was under my feet. As we're talking, facing each other, the whole floor just cantilevers down like that. Ooh. And uh, it was concrete held by rebar pivoted down, um, we both fell. Uh, Gary uh, ended up with some rebar, like going across, whatever, and pushed himself back, he told me later. I ended up with uh, two pieces of rebar uh, facing me like pencils, so you hold them in your gloves, but your firefighting gloves are too bulky. And, uh, you know, I'm a skinny guy, but you're still 200 pounds. Then I had my gear, uh, you know, can't, can't hold two pieces like that, like two pencils. Right. So I'm sliding down and Gary's saying to me, when you hit, when you hit the ground, run, when you hit the ground, run. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know, because we think I'm falling into a transformer pit, you know? Right. And uh, what it was, was, um, well, anyway, I, I fell. And for a second, all I remember was I didn't hit the ground. Then I see the fire go right past me like that. I'm still falling. And, you know, it's just a few moments and then slam and you get hit. And, uh, I uh, luckily landed on some concrete slab that was on an angle like this. So uh, my feet, and by hanging from the rebar, I didn't fall in head first. I, I was going down foot first, feet first. It straightened me out before I fell. So I hit my feet, then my knees, then my chest, then my head, and it dispersed the blow. Uh, broke, my, uh, broke my right ankle, broke my left knee. I held a piece of rebar through my leg, uh, broke my nose, fractured my skull. Uh, and did some internal injury. Mm. And uh, so the reason I'm saying all that stuff, uh, not to rehash them injuries, but um, I survived in spite of myself. First of all, all the things that I was seeing or trying to, to get 
or your other senses, your sixth sense. The smoke, um, I thought was a transformer fire because the rubber and the insulation of, of the cables, don't forget, I was an underground lineman before I was a fireman. I was familiar with these smells. I'd seen them burning and all. Right, right. Um, and the mineral oils and things that cool, there's petroleum products that are not flammable inside the transformers. Well, if they're burning or have fire impinging on them, the smoke that they give off mimicked the car fires. It turns out there were over 200 cars on fire underground and all the rubber of tires, uh, upholstery in cars, all the petroleum products in cars mimicked the burning transformer. So my experience, if you will, um, betrayed me. You know, I, I didn't have the exact answer. I'm trying to, you know, assume, as they would say, but it was rational input, but it didn't come out with the result I needed. So, you know, even though you might think you're on top of your game, and at that time I probably thought I was on top of my game, I was doing well, you, you still there's too many variables. You can't predict them all. Something I try and hammer in my classes, and some guys think, well, if you practice enough, if you drill enough, if you study enough, you'll know everything. No. And it's not the case. So here I got fooled, right? Who would have thought 200 cars on fire? We didn't get the input that it was a big explosion. Then I fall and I survived in spite of myself. The helmet, the new helmet, which I never would have worn, would, my old helmet never would have taken that ride all the way down. It would have, I would have lost it. Had I lost my helmet, it, the, the fracture across my skull in front of my head was from the helmet and the face piece bashing in. Had there been no helmet, I was dead man. My head would have cracked like an eggshell. No if, maybe, done, right? Then uh, when I got knocked, um, I uh, wasn't <laughs> completely on the ball and I'm laying down on my back and I try and, get, I try and move, get up. Of course, when you first get hit hard, you don't feel anything. You know, it's like a, a bad hit. You're kind of like shaking a little bit, but the pain hasn't come yet. So uh, trying to get up and I couldn't get up. And I'm looking around to the right and to the left and I see a piece of rebar here, a piece of rebar here, one here, one there. I'm like, oh my God, I'm impaled. I'm thinking, like, I didn't even want to look, <laughs> look down, you know? Mm -hmm. So you, know, you feel like this, you feel all the way down, like, oh shit, I'm impaled. I think I'm going to feel this sticking out of me. And I didn't. What was holding me back was my Scott pack had broken, the frame had broke, but the high pressure hose held. So the bar was up over by my head, the brackets entangled in debris, and that's why I can't get up. So that, thank God for that. Then I still had the bar um, through my leg, and um, at the same time, I'm starting to get burned a little bit. It's getting real hot. So I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what happened. I still don't know if I fell into a transformer pit. It was just a big pit. I can't see anything. You can only see up maybe eight feet because then the smoke went back down and stopped. And I can't, I can see horizontally a bit. And all I see is arcing and flashing and fire and white hot fire. Again, I think it's transformer still, the arcing. No, it's the, uh, remember back in the day, it was more popular. Kids had those magnesium rims and what have you, sure. car parts. Sure. Some of that was burning white. So again, I'm thinking transformer still. You know, for me, game's over, but I'm still thinking it's a transformer. But I, you know, didn't know. Anyway, uh, fire was coming towards me. I'm giving a report. You know, one of the poor guys that received my radio message. You know, Mayday, Mayday, Rescue One, FL. I don't know where I am. Both my legs are broken and I got fire all around me. Well, who wants to be the officer to get that call, right? right? Now, they can hear me. I can hear them intermittently. I can't hear them, but that's um, game's over for me. I'm just laying there. Well, the fire's coming towards me. What the fire was, was a lot of the gas tanks had let go and the fire was just, you know, moving mm. through the rubble and the debris on the ground. And at the time, show you how lucky I was. Like I said, I survived in spite of myself. So the helmet, which I never would have worn, saved my life when I hit. I'm wearing the right coat and the right uniform. I ended up with just some second degree burns on my back and shoulder. I could have died from five cents worth of fire because I was pinned on it or next to it. So it took me a while to get my leg off that bar. 
And then uh, they were in the, mo- in the middle of remodeling a kitchen, I believe on the B1 level where we were. So, you know, the insulation for a walk-in refrigerator comes as like that insulation with that uh, aluminized right, kind of sheeting to it, you know, mm-hmm. real thin. And if you do any construction, you know, whether it's plywood, sheet rock, it comes often banded in bundles. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a banded bundle of that stuff that had hit the ground and slid out like a deck of cards. If it wasn't for that, I couldn't have slid myself on that surface, you know? So that helped me get, you know, however many feet I got, I don't know how far I, tra- I crawled into um, what was, I thought running water was a mix of water and sewage. Well, I was like, I'd rather lay in that than burn to death. I didn't know what was going on. And again, fractured skull, not thinking completely. But um, I didn't get away from that fire fast enough. Had I had on my other coat, that real lightweight coat with the um, uh, compromised liner and all, I would have been burned badly. So the helmet, the coat, wearing everything I was supposed to do, no cheetah that day, saved my life. Uh, so I would like to say I saved my own life because I was such an awesome rescuer. Negative, Ghost Rider. That's not what happened. I saved my life in spirit spite of myself because my officers knew I could be an idiot and kept a lid on me and I wore what I was supposed to wear for once in my life. So yes, the roof rope rescue was a success because of other men helping me and pushing me and training me hard and I fell in line. And uh, the 93 bombing, um, learning lesson, you can prepare yourself as much as you can, but you're never that sharp or that much on top of your game that you know everything. You can still get fooled. And the backup for when you get fooled is to have all of your proper safety equipment on. Uh, I'll preach that every day, Bobby. I'm right, <clears throat> right there with you. <clears throat> yeah, I've always been called a safety Nazi, and I don't care. You know, mm-hmm. I just don't care. The one good thing about one of the best things I was ever taught about being a boss was if you want to make friends, get a dog. <laughs> because if you can't tell people things they don't want to hear, don't yeah. be a boss. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you know, it's funny that you say that I admire you for that. And a lot of other guys don't forget I retired as a lieutenant, but (laughs) I was never really a boss. I I was hurt. I was still a fireman. So lieutenant was some time at the fire academy, some time on the fire boat. But um, I was not in a position to have to lead guys in a fire in a firehouse like that and worry about, uh, you know, I didn't have to overcome the peer pressure and mature in that way. Because I got hurt before that time came for me, you know. Well, and I got lucky. I, I got taught by a lot of really great people. And it mm-hmm. really helped me at FDIC because, you know, running that giant training program, I got zero tolerance for the people who don't follow my rules. Yes. And, and I've got the unique distinction of having fired Bobby Hoff. <laughs> 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 yeah. The legendary firefighter. I was like, you're out of here. And you fired him. Good man. Uh, a great man. We were dear friends forever afterwards. He used to always give me a hard time about it. And he said, you were right. You know, I was phoning it in. So, you know, and, and not for nothing. It, but so real quick, wrap it up. We'll bring a yes. bow on it. So today you got a great training company. How can people get a hold of you for training? Oh, uh, my, the name of my training company is uh, Glacier Rescue Solutions or GRS. And you can just uh, email me at Glacier Rescue Solutions, uh, Kevin Shea at Glacier Rescue Solutions.com. Okay. Um, Got a website? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's up, Glacier Rescue Solutions.com. Glacier um, brand Rescue new. So uh, you probably have to go on the 50th page of Google to f- find it. I'm not sure. Well, I hope but, you um, do. Yeah, Tech Rescue, I love it. Uh, or they can call me, you know. Uh, my number on the business card is my cell phone anyway, 406-210-4999. And, um, one more time. Yeah, or, one more time. What's that? The number one more time. Sure. 406-210-4999. And uh, I was hoping to see you at FDIC. I'm sorry for this year, but uh, whatever it Comes around again. I'll be there for you. And uh, I'm like something you stepped in, Bobby. Yeah, oh, that's, yeah, oh, that's Kevin on my shoe again. He's still here. A, like a like a dirty shirt and a bad penny. Keep turning up, right? That's right, brother. 
Still That's here. Right. So, but I'm, you know, we're not done yet. The year ain't over. I got a few tricks up my sleeve still. You know me. I'm working. I'm working something right now with some really, really still, good people. I still work for you, Chief. I wherever. I, I'd I'd go into a fire with you any day, Kevin. Even even as old and busted up as we are. No, dude. No more. No more of that. Remember, growing up, I always wanted to be a fireman. But if Sister Mary so ferocious asked me right now in high school what I want to be, a retired fireman. Sister. So I don't want to be a fireman anymore. I want to be a retired fireman. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're the man, Bobby. Uh, Kevin, I love you, man. I, I, I can't wait to see you again. And uh, Yeah, it'll be good. One of these days, we got to get out here in a, a duck blind for a couple hours and or drop a couple of lines out here. I have a new adventure, Bobby. I'll What's text that? you some pictures when this video's over. Um, yeah. I have some pet goats I'm raising since they were yeah. babies. I bottle fed them. And I'm hoping that they'll be my pack animals for when I go bow hunting. So instead of horses and mules, I just bring my goats. But my wife is convinced that I've spoiled them so badly that, they that won't I'm going to have to get a backpack to carry the goats right. with me. Right. You'll, be carrying, you'll, you'll be carrying the mules. You'll be yeah. carrying yeah, those goats. Be carrying the goats. You'll be carrying They're the goats. so spoiled. <laughs> uh, Love them. I'm not surprised. Uh, Life is good, brother. Life is you know, good. I can't. Thank you enough for taking time out of your day today. And uh, absolutely, to Bobby. two legendary stories. I mean, uh, you know, the, the we're losing that oral tradition. And, and two you're lucky days, there. Bobby. Pardon? Just two lucky days. That's two what lucky days. But it's part. Yes. The oral tradition of what we do is so important. And and I want the the firefighters today who are out there, who, who are creating more uh, legends and and stories and that we can because oh, yeah. there's stories inside every story you know there's a the, the locker with the right gear and the locker with the gear you'd like to wear right oh and yeah that's a great lesson for everybody i mean you know never never play fast and loose with your gear right and now i'm trying to teach men and women about the the dangers of uh, our gear inherently and Yes. And, and it's a tough, it's a tough story to tell because now we know what these PFOAs and PFOSs and long chain C's that we probably shouldn't wear our gear unless we're going to fight a fire. You know, yes. don't, don't be wearing it at car accidents. Don't be wearing it to go to the grocery store. And don't be wearing it because it's cold outside. You know, if you're going to put your battle rattle on, it means you're going to fight. You're going to fight yes. fire. And then yes. when you're done fighting fire, take it off. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, 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 I, and I, that's not an easy message to tell, but it's one that has to get out there. And, you know, and we're getting there. I mean, uh, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and you and I joined when we were still riding the tailboard and wearing three quarter boots and, 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 and it wasn't any better than today. I don't care what people say. Oh, there's the good old days. No, today are the good old days. No, no. Best days of today. And, oh, and I tell you, I look at my grandson, my grandson lives with me. I love that boy to death. And when they say like, Oh, the younger guys are not as good as the older guys. Not like the old day. That's such bullshit. I that boy is stronger than me, smarter than me, and more well-rounded, and so are his friends. I envy them. I envy kids, them. I wish I was one of them. These yeah. kids I get to work with, I can't hold a candle to these kids. No, they're the best. And, and, and I wouldn't have been able to hold a candle to them 35, 40 years ago either. No, they're more knowledgeable and more well-rounded than, than what we were exposed to. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I think your the, finest the, firefighters are coming up today. As far as what experiences we had, it's not up to you when you're born. It's up to no. you to do what's in front of you. And no. I think these guys are... And girls are fantastic. You know? They say they say the moment makes the man. And uh, right now we're seeing these young people out there, these millennials and Zs, they're showing up. They're not complaining. They're doing their yeah. jobs. Most of the whining's coming from the old old guys. You know, the way I everybody it. ages gracefully. You know, I don't know. <laughs> and I know. being thirty nine <laughs> myself. Well, unlike you and I, brother, we, we age gracefully. This is nothing but wisdom here because we're awesome. There Let's tell go. each other that. You there know? you go. Nobody else is going <laughs> to. I'm going to go check in with my boss and, and see what she's uh, planning for our, our dinner. And uh, Kevin, I just. I'm going to do the same, Bobby. I hope uh, I didn't keep you too long. Oh, man. Thanks was... for talking. And uh... No, I always love our talks. And, and, and I love, I'm, I'm so grateful for you for sharing those stories. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the folks that we've lost that uh, from that day, it honors their memory so people could hear the story firsthand from someone who was there. And, yeah. and I think that the, uh, the 93 bombing is also something where there are a whole lot of really important lessons that we still need to be talking about. Yes. And this is all, 
you know, there's a plethora of stuff from the 93 bombing. Every, every event has a, has a lesson to share inside of a lesson to share. It's like a, what do they call them? Those Russian dolls, right? You just yes, absolutely. Keep opening it yeah. and opening it. And, and, and it's not that anybody did anything wrong or anybody did anything, you know, stupid. It's just what everybody did because all the decisions yeah. we make at the time we think are going to work or we wouldn't make them. Yes. You know what I mean? A mistake is only a mistake in hindsight. Yes. Like my fourth wife, I don't know, you know, I was a, just kidding. I'll even marry once. <laughs> I'll even marry once. But, 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 the, but people forget that. So, yeah. hey, uh, thank you for joining me on the uh, National Fireman's Journal. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Bobby. It's good to see you. Uh, you're, you're one of the most important pages in this journal, and you always will be. So uh, I, I appreciate you, Bobby. You thank done. you very much. No, and thank you for everything you've done and everything you continue to do. So it's Glacier Fire, Glacier. Glacier Rescue Solutions. Glacier Rescue Solutions, Kevin Schultz. My wife calls it Goat Rescue Solutions because how much I love my goat. Glacier Rescue Solutions. Glacier Rescue Solutions. Yeah. Hey, this is the National Fireman's Journal, and we'll see you here next time. Thanks for listening in. Bye Take now. care, Bobby.